Um, yeah, and I hope you are going to be to be blessed and to officially declare that the seminar is now open. Karibu sana, Pastor. Those who are outside, please, if you can make your way in. Um, I know that there are those who are watching us online. We welcome you to join us in today's session. Um, if you have any question, you can type it on the, on the comment section. Uh, but also you can reach us on 07... Um, Five zero seven five three seven five nine. We will type the number on the YouTube channel, Apochini, uh, so that you can type in your questions and we'll be able to respond to them in the course of the day. Uh, for those who are here, welcome. We are privileged and honored to have Senior Counsel Dr. Fredo Jambo to come and speak to us today. Um, there's a lot, a lot, you know, I was reading through his profile on, on his company, there's a lot that can really be said about him. Uh, but I remember when I came to Baptist, um, my first introduction of him was Uncle Fred, you know? <laughs> He's our uncle. <laughs> yeah, but he, he comes to us today to speak on uh, succession, succession planning. Um, and we are so privileged and honored. Uh, he is married to Auntie Grace Sojambo, uh, and together they are blessed with uh, three, ch four children, four children, yeah. And uh, one of our pastors, Pastor Kemba, is an in-law to the family, uh, married to Pastor Melina, who is our worship uh, pastor on Gong Road. Uh, but um, he'll come and share more that he would want to tell us about himself and his family. Karibu sana. Uh, allow me to say a prayer. Our God and our Father, we, we thank you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing Dr. Fred Ojambo to us today. We are so honored and it's a privilege uh, knowing that he comes as a vessel. You've sent him with your word for your people today, Jehovah, King of Glory. How I pray, Father, that would you use him as he ministers to this congregation, as he teaches us, Lord, with the wealth of knowledge that you have given to him, Jehovah God, on even today as we look on matter succession. And Jehovah God, I pray uh, for the congregation that is seated here, that uh, watching us online, and many who will watch this after that, Jehovah King of Glory. Father, may this have an impact and um, reach out to many families out there that are asking questions, families that are stuck in, in, um, in, in fights, Lord, and battles on successions, families that just want to know what to do when it comes to succession. And so, Lord, we commit ourselves to you, and we pray that would you come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, lead pastor, and thank you for letting me come uh, to Ongatarongai, NBC Ongatarongai, and to join you in this very important subject of succession. It's always a joy to come to Ongatarongai. You know, it's, a, it's amazing how this place has changed. When we first came here, to dedicate these grounds for the work and ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ many years ago, this was just a bush. It was just a bush and we looked at this and we all had to have faith that something was going to happen here. But my goodness, what has the Lord done? He's done tremendous work in this place to see what has happened to see, I've come here on a Sunday and to see the number of people here, and particularly children and young people who are, are in some way our legacy. And so when you talk about succession, 
we're actually talking about that. And I'm so grateful that uh, the pastor and uh, those who have been involved have thought about this because it's such an important aspect of all of us. Because succession has to do with legacy. It has to do with what you leave. Not just in terms of wealth, but in terms of faith and faithfulness, succession has to do with legacy. And it's important for us to think, to know that because quite often when we talk about succession, many people will say, well, I, I don't really have anything to leave behind. But you do. Whether you have wealth or not, you have a lot to leave behind. So the important thing is to think about what you are to leave behind. The legacy, a legacy of excellence, a legacy of faith, a legacy of faithfulness. All those have to do with succession. Just like you do succession planning in any organization where you think about bringing new, new talents, to take over and to continue with the vision that you may have had from the very beginning. So that's important. So succession planning presumes that you have a vision. You have a vision for who you are. You have a vision for your family. If you are married and you have children or, or a spouse, or even if you're not married, you have a vision for the future. Even though we may not be in the future, but we must have a vision for the future. Because the future is part of us. And that's why it's, it's so important that we think that way. And particularly also, from, because we live in a very diverse world, extremely diverse. No longer do we all live in ethnic cocoons, in our little world of our own, which only we understand. No, we're much, we live in a world which is so diverse. And the pressures on us are incredible. And so we must, we're not insulated from others. And so it becomes important for you and I to think about how we live in that world and how when we exit it, we will leave it. And so when you talk about succession planning, it, has, it traverses all that, not just wealth. But specifically today, we want to talk about what you leave behind in terms of wealth. Now, wealth does not mean a lot of wealth. If you look at yourself, there is something you can leave behind. Your shoes, your books. You know, you, in fact, if you think about it, you leave everything behind. You leave everything behind. And so the question is, just how do you want to leave it? How do you want to leave it? It's not as if you're just going to throw it away. How you have to leave it? And to whom do you want to leave it? And why do you want to leave it that way? So the questions that must be in your mind have to do with that. What do I have to leave? To whom do I leave it? Why do I want to leave it that way? I've been in legal practice now for almost 49 years. And I have seen the pain and the anguish and the conflict that have happened in families because whoever has been there, either maybe the, uh, the, uh, the head of the family or any other part of the family has just left. And suddenly, there are so many questions. We just recently lost a friend who was uh, buried not too long ago. 
And the first thing I received from the family was, did she leave a will? Or did she say anything to you which we need to know about the things that she's left behind? So it's a question that everybody has in mind. You all know about the difficulties, particularly uh, in African societies, and not just African societies, but particularly in African societies, where a person dies, and suddenly, and particularly if it's a man who's died, the in-laws suddenly flock into the house and they take away things away. The poor widow is left there. Nobody asks, how did these things come here? Nobody asks, how are they running when they're here? No one. It's just because you, you act in a particular way, because the particular community might feel that everything belongs to the man, regardless of the situation. And so that brings conflict and anger and violence. And I've seen estates which have gone on for years, fighting in courts. People die, people kill each other, just because they want to reach out something. So it, it is a very, very important question. And it is an important question for you and for me. And to think about what we do about the things that are around us. And so it's important for you to have some idea what the law of succession is all about. Because the law of succession is, is the law that deals with inheritance to property. And succession plays a crucial role in determining how the deceased person's property is transferred to their heirs or beneficiaries. And there are two, there's a difference between an heir and a beneficiary. And I'll talk to you about that later. And this law provides a set of rules and procedures to ensure that the property is distributed according to the wishes of the deceased. So it's important that the deceased, the person who dies, or is able to explain or give out their wishes regarding the property that they may have. And so there are ways in which that can be done. It can be done orally, just by speaking it out. When I leave, please, that cow should go to so-and-so, that goat should go to so-and-so, my clothes should go to so-and-so, and etc. It can be done orally. Or sometimes it could be done in writing and written in any kind of language. It doesn't have to be in English. It doesn't have to be in Swahili. It can be in any language. The main objective of succession is to ensure that the rightful claimants inherit the property. Because let's not make any um, mistake about this, there are people who can rightfully claim certain property that's left behind. Others who are not rightfully uh, claim it. And um, not everybody should be able to inherit property from a person. And the law is supposed to prevent disputes and conflicts among potential beneficiaries. Now, just for your information, the law of succession in Kenya is an act of parliament called the Law of Succession Act, which is chapter 160 of the laws of Kenya. And its main focus is to safeguard the property of the future generation or generations. And it provides for the most advisable way of uh, making sure that a person's wealth is transferred well and properly and uh, avoids other ways. And one of the ways in which it provides is by making a will. A will, a written will. 
Of course, it provides for other oral wills, but it provides for a written will. But you know, wills are not the only way in which you transfer property. Uh, and I think it's important to realize that because wills also can have difficulties and wills can be abrogated. The courts can decide that this will cannot be enforced because it did not meet certain legal uh, requirements. So wills are not necessarily, the, 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 they are one of, the one of the best ways to do it, but they are not the only way to do it. And sometimes wills can be difficult, particularly if they are written badly, because they've got to be interpreted. And when you interpret anything that's written, um, there could be difficulties. And we've had many, many places where wills have been written and the courts have decided that those wills cannot be enforced in the way they are. Like say somebody uh, said, I want to leave my car to my wife and the person has two wives. <laughs> so who is it? Is it wife number one or number two or number three? So you see, there's a, there's a, there, there can be a difficulty of finding out what, what it is. And you could say, I want to leave. That's why it's very important, for instance, in, in, in the will, even if you're married to one person, to say, I want to leave my car to my husband, Fred. And not just Fred, but Fred, you write out all the names, so that nobody can ever think that somebody else could come up and say he's Fred and therefore becomes. So all I'm saying basically is that because wills are susceptible to uh, interpretation, sometimes interpretation could be, could be difficult. So there, are, so there are times when maybe you as a person have to look at your family and to see whether with the will is the best way of transferring the wealth that you have. Because there are other ways. There are, for instance, uh, there are ways in which you can transfer the, the, the goods by what is called a discretionary trust. A discretionary trust. And a discretionary trust is a trust that you form which then you hand over your property to trustees who may or may not be part of the family. And those trustees then um, are supposed to, di to, dispute, to distribute that property in accordance with the wishes that you have, a discretionary trust. Well, one of the reasons why the, this thing of a discretionary trust came up was because in the past, there used to be what you call death tax. In other words, when you had a will and you transferred property to uh, your, whoever your, your beneficiaries are, there used to be a tax that was imposed on some of the property that you passed on. And so people gave up the wills, so to speak, and they created this thing called the discretionary trust. And in effect, the discretionary trust only means that those properties that you put in a discretionary trust are not longer your property. They, are, they belong to trustees. But even though you, they belong to trustees, you issue what is called a letter of wishes. So the trustees have a letter of wishes in their back pocket, so to speak. And when you pass on, they take out the letter of wishes. And from that letter of wishes, they can distribute the property. And then there will be no tax because those are not your goods anymore, even though you have some uh, led to it. So a discretionary trust is another way in which you, you can distribute your wealth. And, I, and, and, and I'll, I will tell you some of the circumstances in which it may be better to do that. But there is also what you can distribute your wealth by what is called a gift intervivals. Gift intervivals. That means you make a gift during your lifetime. 
the person to whom you give that, you make that gift, doesn't take the things then, but those things become theirs automatically upon your death. You see, the will, when you have a will, when you pass on, the property in the will doesn't automatically pass to your beneficiaries. You have to go to court with the will and do what is called a sealing on a will to get a probate. You had a grant of probate where the court will look at the will, will look at the, will collect all the, um, all the properties that you have, then grant you probate, which then allows the executors of your will, which are the people whom you have appointed to accept the will, then can start the process of distributing the, the goods in accordance with your will. Now that, so with regard to the gift intervivals, it's automatic that immediately the person passes on, that property or whatever becomes yours automatically. You don't have to go through a whole lot of uh, um, processes and procedures in, in court, particularly. Now there are sometimes when, when that's a good thing, particularly when you, you've grown up and you've seen, if you're a person, if you're a mother or father, parents of children, particularly grown up children, you look at your children and you can tell from what you see whether these children are able to do certain things or, or they are not able to do others. And so you make a gift in survivors based on that. So you got, if you've got a property, for instance, you run a business and you have a shop, and at the same time you have another hotel, or and you have a house, and you have three children. You look at the children, now this, uh, I call them children because they're your children, but they may be grown up. Then you decide yourself who you think has a ta talent to run the hotel, who has a talent to run the shop, and who just likes the house. And then you make a gift into vivos while you're still alive. While you're still alive. So as soon as you go, those gifts then that bequest goes to them automatically. Now that can be a very good thing, but it can also be difficult because when you have different properties, you have one property in Ongatarungai, another property in Isinia, uh, another property in Karen, and you decide, I think I'll give uh, Louise here, I'll give a Karen, Peter, I'll give Ongatarungai, you might find that Peter doesn't like Ongatarongai. They would rather have Karen. But you've made that distribution. So there can be problems as well as a result of that. But what I'm saying basically is that there are other ways in which you can distribute your property so that you avoid if there uh, any, any conflict that may arise as a result of the will. But the will is a good way of doing it because you can be very precise in a will. You can write it in such a way that not only do you precisely give it to one of your children or one of whoever it is who are the beneficiaries, but you can by so writing the will in such a way that you remove everybody else with regard to that thing. That is a, that is a good thing about the will, because you can be very, very specific. You not only point out to a particular person, but you remove everybody else for that person, so, that, so there are no problems. So the will is one of the ways. But let me start by saying this. One of, the th one of the points which 
you would have liked me to address would be the openness to the creation and management of family wealth. I think it's important for you and I to think about what we do with the wealth while we are at it, while we're building it. Not when we've accumulated a lot, but while we are building it. It's very important that you think about that. Often, a lot of people who have created problems for themselves, they've created a lot of wealth, and then they've died. And they've suddenly left a lot of problems with the family. Even when the will is there, they've left a lot of problems with the family. Struggling to see who should... I'm involved with quite a number of these, even now. So what I am saying basically is that even as you seek to, to take this, to take that, or you acquire this, or acquire this, you must have in mind that you're passing. And therefore, what would you want to do with this particular thing? It seems very important to do that. If you have a family, it's very important for the family to have some idea of what you're doing and not live a secretive life. Have, the family should have some idea of what you're doing, what you're accumulating. But part of it is, of course, the need to be transparent to your family. A lot of people come to a point where when they pass on, the family come in and they, have, they realize they have so much wealth, but they don't know how the wealth was acquired. And, and was it acquired properly? Or was it acquired wrongly? And so it's important for the family to have some idea, particularly for us men. And I say men because in our, in our society, much of the wealth, even that which has been obtained by women, is held by men. And so it's so important for you and I as a man to ensure that our family have some idea of how we're making that, that wealth. So that when we pass on, we're not leaving them with such immense problems, not just within the family, but from outside the family. People come in, suddenly people come in, and you realize that uh, uh, perhaps daddy wasn't holding this money by, for himself, was holding it for someone else, and there's a problem. So it is extremely important for us to be absolutely transparent. There are times when you, you can't tell your people everything that is going on, but you can tell them basically what is going on so they, they know what it is and you safeguard it for them. So let me um, first of all just go into the issue of preparing wills. Now wills are documents which allow a person, and that person is usually called a testator in law, or a testatrix, depending on whether it's a woman or a man. It allowed that person to express their wishes regarding the distribution of their property after their death. And some of the advantages of making a will are, uh, like one, maintaining control over your property upon your death. In other words, strictly speaking, people who you appoint to distribute to wealth under your will must comply with your wishes. And so you maintain the control of your property upon death. But it's only up to a certain point. I know, and this uh, you, you, I think you need to know, that there is also a saying that you cannot 
control people from the grave. In other words, if you write a will, for instance, that you give all your cows to your cats or your dogs, you might find that the court will not enforce it in this, this jurisdiction. In other jurisdictions, that happens. There are people who are extremely wealthy, and they've suddenly, at the end of it, given all their, their wealth to their little cat in the home. And the courts have enforced it. The only problem is that the cat has no idea how to deal with that wealth. And so you have other people actually dealing with that wealth on behalf of the cat. So there's an, an, a way in which you, can't, you can control your wealth to a degree. To a degree. But it is one of the greatest reasons why you have a will. The will is to control your property so that people just don't, um, they go according to your wishes. Secondly, the, by a will, you can appoint guardians to your children. When we were a lot younger and we were beginning to get our children, um, we made a will. And the will, amongst other things, was to provide for our young children, because we were little children, and we, if we both died, for instance, uh, even though in, in our culture, those children will be looked after by our family, but there are times when, when you've moved and you've gone into a different culture, which is coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, and what that means, you can't just hand over your children to anybody else. You've got to, one of the things that is so important to you is to ensure that those children are brought up in a way that they love the Lord. And so we made nominations that if, and if we pass on, one of our children are still infants or are still under the age of minority, we would want such and such a person to look after them. And if not that person, then another person to look after them. Of course, you're doing that in the hope and prayer that that person will not um, immediately pass on after you. <laughs> but, but you see, by, the, by your, your will, you can appoint guardians for your minors. And I think it is important. It's your duty, it's my duty, to ensure that we have at least given thought to that and not just leave it to chance. The third possible uh, 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 advantage of having a will is also that by f you are fully disclosing the property and the assets that you owned during your lifetime. You produce all of them during your lifetime. You know, uh, sometimes when people have relationship outside their marriage, for instance, sometimes they give out property to people who are not part of their family. And, and that property may not be in that person's name. So when they pass on, there's great deal of conflict because the, the, the interloper, the person who, who is messing about in the, in the family, tries to grab that property, and the family says, no, but that property belongs to us. And so there's a, there's a problem there. And it is important that when you have a will, you fully d disclose all the property in your name, and which is not in your name, but which is, belongs to you. So full disclosure of the property. And also another, another advantage of a will is that, generally speaking, it avoids disputes among, amongst family members with regard to that property. So that we do not, when the will is read, and you have said that my, my whatever it is that I, I have, goes to Peter, my son, that's it. Should be, that should be the end. 
there should be no reason why the others say, well, yeah, you gave it to Peter, but he shouldn't have. I, I'll, I'll fight for it. A will is supposed to, uh, to ensure that there are no disputes that is very clear as the members of family. I remember I've just told you, though, that sometimes there could be problems. Then, um, fifthly, the doing a will also could benefit persons outside the family, such as friends, the close relatives, religious institutions, and charitable organizations. There should be no reason why, for instance, if I were to leave and I had a property, and I'd like that property, the, the, uh, the income from that property to go to my church, there should be no reason why I couldn't do it in a, in a, in a, in a will. And by doing that, I avoid any possibility of my family coming up and saying, no, 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 you can't do that to Nairobi Baptist Church. No, 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 do it somewhere else. That, those are some of the reasons why one writes the will and why it's, it's good. <laughs> now, the, the, and I think for, for the sake of it, the form of the will, there's no specific form in which a will takes. A will, as I've told you before, may be oral, in other words, it's spoken, or it could be written. And uh, it may be, as long as it satisfies the rules of validity that are provided for in law, then it's good. And in the event that there's a conflict which arises between the contents of a written and oral will, the written will will prevail. Now let me talk about oral wills. Oral wills are the ones where a person speaks and you will realize that that has always been so in our traditional society where the person is at the end of their life at least so they feel and then they speak out when people are around them they say what their wish is um, when I pass on please this thing should be passed on to my daughter, to my son, whatever, or to my brother. That's an oral will. But according to the law now, an oral will, even though acceptable, can only be acceptable if it's made in the presence of two witnesses. Two witnesses. There have to be, shall I say, at least two witnesses for it to be valid. An oral will, you must have two witnesses who are hearing you say it. But also, an oral will can only be valid for three months. Only three months. So that if, if you, you make the oral will and the witnesses are there, then the person either must die within three months and if it doesn't, then that oral will is no longer valid. He has to do another one. So that's the difficulty about an oral will, three months. But there are privileged oral wills. And the privileged oral wills are oral wills which are made by people in the, in, in the disciplined forces, in the armed forces, either policemen, or a man in the, in the defense forces, they can make oral wills and they will last for as long as it's needed. For instance, if a soldier in, uh, is uh, serving in DRC for, from Kenya and is wounded, and therefore in that moment of anguish says to the people around, I have my home in Busia, and I have uh, this and that and the other. I'd like this, that, and the other said, so, you know, uh, given to, to my people. Even if that person lived for another six months, that oral will will still be enforceable. 
But for a civilian, an oral will can only be enforced if it is enforceable within three months. So it's just, that's the difference between an oral will and a, and, and, and a written will. And oral wills, um, of course, have their own difficulties, particularly if you, if you haven't recorded them. These days we have all these gadgets, we have mobile phones. So the person wants to speak, you can record them. And you can record them and say, uh, here, I'm, we're here on this particular day, at this particular time, around me is Mr. and Mrs. so-and-so, and, so, so, and this is what, and then you record the testator. And um, that could be used in court should you need uh, to have that, have that done. But as I say, for a civilian, it only lasts for three months. And so don't, don't ever go to court after one year and then say, yes, those are all or ill. My father said this, that, and the other. They'll throw you out with a great big laughter. That's one. But then the other is the written will, which I think uh, um, most of you uh, know about. Now, the, the written will is what you call a test state succession. Test state succession. And a test state succession is a process which entails the, the executor, the executors, the, the person who, who, who do the will afterwards, obtaining um, a probate of all letters of administration with the, um, in court. A written will must have the following provisions. Of course, it must be in writing. And it doesn't have to be in any, uh, any particular language, but it must be in a language that is understood. It's difficult to, to write an oral will in tongues, if you see what I mean. So you ha it has to be something that's understood by those who um, are writing. So it must, be, it must be written, and it must be written, it doesn't have to be written in any particular material, it can be written on anything. Uh, it doesn't have to be written by a lawyer uh, or anything like that, it can be written in any material. But it must be signed by the testator, that person who's giving the will. Now that, that does not mean that they have to take a pen and actually squiggle something on, 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 the pen, on the paper. They could put a thumbprint, or they could put the, the whole palm print, or they could, they don't even have to, they could, they, they could be put initials, could put in assumed names, a rubber stamp with a testator's name. So just anything to indicate that the person who is giving it is that person. But it also must be made before two witnesses, at least two witnesses. And those two witnesses must sign that they have watched or seen him sign. They do not have to know the content of the will, but they must sign that they were present. That means they sign, each one of them signed that they were present when the testator made that, that uh, signed the, the document. All the three, that is the testator and the two witnesses, must sign in the presence of each other. So you can't sort of sign this here and then take it off to a testator somewhere else. They've got testator has to be has to be has to be there. But if the the benef if the test the witness happens to be a beneficiary, 
in other words, if, for instance, I am in my, in my will, I have given certain bequests to one of my children, and I want one of my children to be the witness to sign. Remember, the, 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 children does not, the child does not look into the content. They're simply confirming that I'm the one signing it. Now, if that child is a beneficiary, or intended to be a beneficiary, then that person must have two other witnesses. This is what I mean. So you have two witnesses you know, you know, testifying that you have signed a document, and one of the witnesses who may be your, your, your beneficiary also has to have two other witnesses to sign to say that he was the one who was, who was there. And, and then, um, then finally this document then is kept, either you keep it yourself as a, as a testator, or you hand it over to a friend to hold it for you until, not to open it until the, 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 the day you have passed on, or you give it out to trustees, and trustees can be individuals or, or companies, or sometimes people hand them over to lawyers who then keep them in their strong rooms until you've passed on. And when you've done, then the, the will is produced, everybody's called together, they open the, the will, and then the, the lawyer would probably will already have known what's in there because they, they have already done it for you. But then they read it out. That will will have appointed somebody called a te an executor of the will, could be your ch son, your wife, your, your husband, your, your friend, your brother, whoever. But you've, you appoint somebody to be the one to, exec to do the, the execution of that will. Once that is done, one, uh, you, the executor or, or the personal representative of the will has done, then the will is taken to court, and the court then grants you probate, which then allows you to do what you need to do to, to, to distribute uh, uh, the, 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 the property. If the person who is dying does not have a will, then he is said to have died intestate. Remember the, 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 the one in the will is called a testator? This person who dies without a will, is called, the, the, uh, the estate is called an intestate or intestacy rules. A lot of the people in this country die without wills. And a lot of the people will die without making any gifts into vivos. A lot of them will die without making any discretionary trusts, so that their wills, uh, their, their, their property is vacant in some ways. But then there are rules that apply to intestacy. And they're more difficult than where there is intestacy. First of all, An intestacy happens one where there is no will or where the will has been declared invalid by a court of, court, a court of law because of some uh, technical reasons or deficiency. When that happens, then the court can appoint the people who are called administrators, the administrators of the estate. And courts will normally ask members of the family to come through and choose somebody to be an administrator. If they cannot choose the person for some reason, then the court can appoint an administrator or administrators. If it's a ladies and administratrix, and so the court can do that so as to give power to those people to ensure that the property 
is dealt with. But if either the court finds it very difficult to do that because of such acrimony in the family, then that property can go to the public trustee. A public trustee is part of the state, is the Attorney General's chambers, who then become the trustees. They, they take the property and they now are the ones who know how to distribute it. But they'll also distribute it only in accordance with the law. And the law, which I to told you about the Succession Act, has set out um, priorities of how you distribute property. And generally speaking, and I don't really want to get you into too much of it, generally speaking, the law provides for the distribution of property first in priority to the family of the testator, to the family of the testator, before going out to anywhere else, the nuclear family of the, uh, of the testator. If the nuclear family is not there or is not sufficient, then it can go beyond that and go to other people. Like, like for instance, if, if I, if, as I passed on and I didn't have any will, then the first people, the first claimants, will be my spouse and the children of our marriage. If that's not sufficient, then it could go to the next level, which would be my siblings or my parents, if they're still alive. If not them, then my siblings. If not them, then my step-siblings, if we have any. My step or half-siblings. And if they're not there, then it could go beyond that to friends. So, so there is a, there's a way in which uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the law has been structured so as to, to make, that, make that possible. It also provides, and, and this, is where, uh, this is where I think we, we really must uh, be careful about. The law was changed some time ago and put in a section 3, subsection 5 of, of the Act, which allowed people in polygamous uh, relationships to enable people who may not be directly your family, particularly if it's a, if it's a, it's a, it's a woman, to, to, to inherit. So that, in fact, you could be you could have a family where a man has been married in a monogamous relationship in a, in, in a church or in, in, at the uh, Attorney General's chambers. And they've been going like that. The family don't know that there may be another family somewhere else. And then the person dies. The, the law was changed so as to include other other, it's women, not men, but other women who may not have been married to that person in the usual way, but who have a relationship with that person to come and, and, and inherit. And that is why, because of that, that is why it's so important to deal with these issues while you're still alive, to ensure that when you're, when you're writing the will and you have that situation, then you must ensure that your family is somehow protected. Of course, the children of the other woman, so to speak, still can, will be part of the ones who benefit in a situation like this even where the will has not provided for it. So, uh, so I think you, you really must remember that. Even if you have, you have children outside and you have uh, your primary family and you pass on and the, the will only relates to your primary family, the other family have the right, if they are children, 
the right to show that they are your children, uh, they are your dependents, and somehow come in, uh, you know, come in and take a bit of the action there. And that is where, so for instance, that is where the whole idea of gift intervivals becomes very important. Because once you've made a gift intervivals to your family, there's no one who could come and say, oh, but I'm Fellow Jambo's son. It doesn't matter what they say. The gift has been made, it's been gave to the particular person, and that's it. So I'm giving you these things because you, I think one needs to know. We, we have to, we live, and I said we live in a diverse world where people sometimes are not exactly what they seem to be. And particularly men, let's be honest. Particularly men. There are, of course, there could be other women. And so it's important for us, and particularly us who are Christians, it's important for us to ensure that we do everything that we can, we can possibly do while we're still alive to ensure that our family doesn't suffer because of the mistakes we have made. Or even some, not just mistakes, some of the things that we have done sinfully out there. So I think, I think it, it is very, very important. Look at, the, because the rules of intestacy can be quite, quite horrendous uh, to, to some people. So, where, but generally speaking, there are rules of intestacy, which shows that where the deceased has left one surviving spouse, for instance, and a child or children, then that surviving spouse has certain rights that are encrypted in the law, and that uh, to be, and, and it says spouse mainly because, uh, mainly it's supposed to support women, but, but it also uh, means men. That is, they will have a right, an absolute right to the, um, the, the effect, personal effects of the deceased, as well as of the home, the matrimony home. Personal effects of it. And these personal effects means household effects, which include clothing and articles of personal use and adornment, furniture, appliances, pictures, ornaments, food, drink, utensils, and other articles of household. So that really, there is no legal reason why when a, when, um, a man dies, for suddenly his family to run in and to take the furniture away from the, from the widow. There is no, that's completely illegal. You cannot do that because she has an absolute right to all those things. Everything that is in a matrimony home. Unfortunately, that does not include motor vehicles or any other thing which is connected to the business or profession of the deceased person. If I passed on today, if, the, if I have a company car, my wife wouldn't have that, my widow would not have that. And, um, or anything to do with my office, but the peop anything that has, is my personal uh, business, they would have that absolutely. In other words, not even the children can turn around and take it away from her. It's absolute um, ownership. But for the matrimonial home, the widow will only have a life interest. Now, a life mean interest means that as long as she is alive, she's entitled to have that home by herself, as long as she's alive. Now, the reason, the rationale to this is that to ensure that 
the widow, and mainly it's a widow, sometimes even the widower, if their spouse then passes on and they have that right, some widows or widowers might decide, I'll sell this property and go somewhere else. The law is supposed to protect the children so that you can't just throw it out. You have a life interest. The children can't throw you out, nor can you throw them out. But you have your life interest, as long as you're alive, that is your, your, is your property. So you have life interest of, 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 of the property. And you hold that property as a trustee for the children, as long as the children are not adults, as long as they're 18 and under, you hold it. But once they get to that age, and they are, they are out of the, of the home, then you have, that is your home. Um, there used to be a law that that life interest was only there as long as a woman was not, did not remarry and used to be pushed. But following the change of the law, now that right exists even if the woman then remarries after the death of her husband. So I, so that, that gives you a flavor of what, uh, what, what, what that is done. Now, that's where the deceased dies, leaving one spouse and child or children. Now, where the deceased has left one surviving spouse but no children, then the law is that the personal household effects of the deceased become absolutely the property of the surviving spouse. Then there is this curious provision that the first 10,000 shillings of the residue of the estate, or 20% of it, remains the absolute property of the widow. What in effect is saying, which is a, a rather curious uh, piece of provision, is that when you have the household, you have the life interest on the ha of, the, of, the, of the house, but you also have a, um, a absolute interest, absolute ownership of the household uh, effects. But anything that's beyond that, if you have other properties, then the first 10,000 shillings is yours, but also 20% of it, you have it as absolute owner. After that, it can be decided how the other one can be distributed, and it will be distributed in accordance with the rules and regulations of intestacy. But then, as you do that, you have a life interest on the whole of the remainder. In other words, even if they try to distribute it, you have the life interest, and the way you ca they can only distribute it if you say so. So there's a way in which where a deceased has left one surviving spouse and no children, then that spouse has a strong connection with all the things that are there left behind. Now, where the deceased has left a surviving child or children, but no spouse, because sometimes that happens. Our father has died, left the mother, and then the mother uh, dies on or the other way around, the whole net intestate estate devolves upon the surviving child or children so that no one else should be able to come around and say, oh, now our uh, uh, um, uh, uh, daughter, uh, whatever, uh, son has died, and there's only these children, would we'll take this property from them and look after them, no? The law says everything goes to those children. They may not be able to run it at that time, in which case a trustee, a trustee will be appointed to 
to run it, but they are the ones who own it. You can't sell it, and if, you, if they're very young children and you want to sell something, say, to provide, to provide for their school fees or anything like that, you've got to go to court and get an order so that the children are not dispossessed because sometimes that happens when the things have been taken away, uh, when children are orphans, then those around us, adults around them, take away this property from them and they use it for themselves and for their own good. The surviving children in, who are orphans own everything in the estate that is left by their parents. Now, where the deceased has left no surviving spouse or children, then the estate estate shall devolve upon the kindred and the estate in the following order of priority. In other words, where I have no children or, or I have had no, neither spouse nor children, then the first order of priority is that the father of the deceased person will be the first in priority and the mother of that deceased person. Then thirdly, the siblings and any child of the deceased brothers and sisters are, will be given in equal shares. And where there are none, they look for the half-brothers, half-sisters, and any child or children of those, uh, those deceased half-brothers and children in equal shares. And if none of those is there, then the relatives who are in the nearest degree of consanguinity, you know, the degree of consanguinity is the blood relationship. So if no one of this is there, then the closest person in degree of consanguinity will be the ones which, for instance, the first cousin, my mother's, my, my father's brother's son, for instance, or my father, my father's brother's daughter. Those are the first degree of consanguinity. You could have my cousin's son. That's the second degree of consanguinity. So you, you then distribute it in equal shares in that way. But if nobody's there, then all that wealth, it now goes to the state. It becomes part of the consolidated fund of the state. So the beneficiary of last resort is always the state. That goes to the state and it goes to the consolidated fund and is used just like like any other um, consolidated fund state. So um, I think I've talked a little bit about where a deceased person is, uh, uh, is polygamous and, um, and I've told you how that can be, uh, that could be in itself a, a difficulty, but law provides for that where the deceased has married more than once, in any system, in any system of law that, that permits polygamy, the household and, uh, and uh, personal effects and the residue of the net interstates shall in the first instance be divided among the houses. So that where you have two houses, for instance, one family and the other family, then you take the, the residue of the estate and divide it in half and, and then uh, give it half to, the, to both houses. But even in those houses, then you have to distribute it in accordance with the rules. In other words, the, the spouse will still have the, uh, the personal, uh, personal effects and household effects as a, as a, uh, absolutely and the life interest for anything else. So, the, so that happens where there are more than one wife. And I've, I think I've already talked about that. Now, the, the, the question of grandchildren, which uh, um, 
you probably should know that grandchildren do not or cannot, in law at least, inherit directly from their grandparents. Unless the grandparent has made a gift into vivals during lifetime, or has done under a discretionary trust, has made certain gifts. For there's a section in the, the act called section 26, which empowers the court to interfere with the testator's exercise of freedom of testator by making provision for any dependent who hasn't been adequately provided for. It allows such a dis, uh, dissatisfied dependent to move to court under section 26. For instance, where you have a family in which um, one child is disabled to the extent that the child may not be able to do or manage to do what everybody else could do, then the court can interfere with the provision even in a will and say even though we are giving 20 shillings for each one of these people, for this particular one, we're giving 40 shillings because of the disability to enable that person to come up is, is some kind of affirmative action to allow that person to be able to get to a point like everybody else. And so the court can in, intervene even where the, 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 um, the will has made explicit provision for others. But it only do that where there are aspects of the family where there is disability or some inability, whatever. If there is a spe special need, the court can do that so that they, 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 they provide for that. And dependence also, and this is where also you need to know, that if you have a person within your home who's your dependent and who are recognized as dependents, they are also eligible to inherit the property of the descendant. And, and, and it's important for us to know that because we live with people. We always live with people and we provide for them. And we've got to think about it because when we go, that person could easily go to court and say, I was a dependent of Fredo Jambo. And the court will give them, even if it's somebody you picked up from the street. You know, it, it is, and, and it is an important thing to think about it, because uh, I, I think even as we're charitable, we've got to know how we want that to work out in our families. Because that could create conflict. When you're gone, and then suddenly, the person may be your relative, or maybe some people who are not relatives, but whom you've brought into the house as an act of charity and mercy, and you've brought them up within the house, they could easily acquire a right which was not there by way of living. It begins to be a dependent. And I'm not, su I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't do that. What I'm suggesting is that as you do that, remember that there, will, there could be difficulties, so you deal with it before there are any problems. Uh, we, uh, in our family, we brought up children. We brought up people who are not even our children um, uh, by, uh, by, by blood, in any sense, even children who are from other countries. And we brought them up as part of the family. And it would be irresponsible of me and indeed us, not to think that if anything happened, that there could very well be a conflict between our own blood children and those children we brought up. So you've got to prepare for that and see how best to deal with it 
if it helps you to do that. So maybe the better way to do it would be a gift into Bibles or, or, or a discretionary trust so that you ensure that there are no conflicts after you've left. Because the law has a way of determining who's a rightful heir. Because an heir is a person who is legally entitled to collect an inheritance when a deceased person did not formalize at the will or the testament. An heir would be my blood, the child of my loins, so to speak, my spouse. All those are heirs. But a beneficiary may not necessarily be your, your heir. And so it's important for you, for all of us, to remember that. Now, I've, now I've kept you speaking for a long time. This is a, it's a long subject, but I think I, I need to wind it up so that I can give the opportunity for questions to, to, um, uh, to come forward. Because it's only through the questions that you begin to see where people are, are at and therefore uh, speak to that thing. But let me just say this as a conclusive point, and that is that because of the complexity of succession law, and because of the little nuances relating to succession law, I would suggest very strongly indeed that it would be advisable to seek legal advice when thinking of what to do with property. And I said to you, you don't have to have a lot of property. In fact, if you, if you look at it, uh, any time you look at it, you have a lot of property with you. And before you draft anything, a will or any document to pass on that property, it would be important to take legal advice and to see how best to deal with that property so as to avoid the conflict that so often uh, gets into families. And strictly speaking, an, an experienced uh, uh, lawyer, the advocate or attorney should provide guidance to you as to what the applicable law is and help address any potential issues or disputes which may arise when a, in a family where members um, find themselves in this situation. Remember that a will, even if you make a will, in 10 years, it comes to an end. So you may need to do what, and a fresh will. It's got a codicil, so as to make it current, so as to make it live. And in 10 years, Circumstances have changed considerably. You've grown older. Maybe some of the, uh, the properties that you had in mind have changed. Are they in nature? You've sold some, you've obtained others. So it's important for you to look at it again if it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a will. When it's a discretionary trust, you don't have to. When it is a, a, a gift in the Bible, you don't have to unless somehow the, any of the properties have gone. And also it's important to, rem to remember that wills can be revoked. In other words, a person who makes it can decide that it trashes that will, either by making a different one or by just taking that will and ripping it. That's one way. But also, wills can be rendered revoked just by marriage, by moving on to, to a marriage. You see, we, we may forget uh, if people get divorced, for instance, and then remarry, that will may be rendered dissuited. In other words, it's, not, it's no longer uh, valid. So it's important for you to, to look at that. 
So it's good to take advice so that you know how best to deal with a property for us. Finally, we have to remember, above all else, that we are Christians. And as the theme for today, that Proverbs 13, 22, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children, to his children's children, is, I think, is an injunction and a warning to all of us that we can't just sit and watch. God expects us as part of our ministry to our families to do things so as to ensure that we give a quiescent uh, future to our children. It's not just something that we do which is good. No, it's a responsibility, a primary responsibility that you and I have. And as Christians, we must look into this and look into it carefully because the failing to do so could create horrendous trouble in our families. May the Lord bless you as you think about this and seek to serve him in this way. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Senior Counsel. Um, you can take some water. That was thank you. quite a mouthful. <laughs> so we want to go to a time of um, question and answer. I think you've received some post it there. You can be able to write down your questions so that we make it a little bit practical for some of us who actually have specific things that they're dealing with. Uh, we can be able to get some good counsel here today. Um, yeah, so we will take those questions. Once you're ready, just raise up your hand. We'll be able to collect them and be able to ask. And our uh, senior counsel will be able to. Thank you very much. So, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask, uh, maybe you can shed some light on why there were boy Otieno versus the clan, and there was a will from SM Otieno, why the courts trashed the will. Uh, sorry, I, I hope I, I, could you just say that again, because I didn't it was, quite. There were boy Otieno. Yes. That, that one was a, a while ago, a Boyoteno versus the clan. Yes. And while there was a will that SM Oteno had left, the, the clan seemed to have, uh, uh, the courts with the clan seemed to have gone, the courts went with the clan's will. So that's something I have always wondered. Yes. Why, why is it that the will was uh, not honored? Yes. Yes. Um, let me just, shall I respond to that or, you, may, yes. Yes, you, you can. Let me just put that down. I just want to know where the law is when you go and those people come carrying the stools and the cooker and everything and I'm standing there with the children with nothing. Where is the law? Because it's not there. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Let me start with that one. Yes. Yeah, I, actually, uh, you know, it's like any other offense. The law is there, but people still commit offenses. I think it's the same way. The problem is that I think as communities, we've tended to, um, to lift our own community feelings, our own ethnic uh, norms, for lack of better terms, above everything else. So that particularly for, for ladies, for widows, immediately after the, their, their spouses die, a lot of their spouses' uh, relatives come in and collect the things as if these are our children, our boys' things. It's 
illegal. It's illegal. And it must be dealt with that way. Completely illegal. Because the law makes a very specific provision for a widow in that sense. So really, I mean, the only thing I can say is that uh, I think people behave like that because people break the law. Everybody knows, for instance, that you, you ride on the left-hand side of the road. But you see how many motorbikes die right on the, on the right side of the law. It doesn't mean that the law is not there. It just means that people don't, don't think about it. And, and so the question, the question is not that the law is there or is not there. The question is, why is it not being enforced? And I think that's a, that's a problem, I, if, as I see it. Going to, to my sister's uh, question about SM Otieno. Now, this was a very clear case of the, of, uh, the court applying Section 26 of the Succession Act, which allows the court to intervene in certain cases. And the, the case in this case was not the distribution of wealth, but how to deal with the body of the deceased person. And there are many rules there which were clashing. Because there is, um, there is a statement in law that there's no property in a dead body. Now, when you say property, it means that there's no ownership of a dead body. And uh, the dead body can be dealt with in some way. Initially, of course, by the family. And the, a lot of people would say, but the dead body will be dealt with in accordance with the law that are applicable to the dead body, not to the people who are alive, but to the dead body. And the, the court there dealt with it in this way. They said that the, the law which is applicable to the dead body was that of the clan, not of the individual. So that the clan have a way in which they dealt with their own uh, deceased persons, the kind of, um, of uh, processes they go through. And therefore, one couldn't say that that dead body is mine because the will says so, because the will uh, hasn't, uh, uh, according to, to the law anyway at that time. And that, is that would not have happened, say, in England. Because in England, the law in this country, uh, as in most of the, there's something called the common law. And the, and, and the act that brought in the common law and various other laws from the Commonwealth left a provision that also customary law is applicable here in cases where uh, it did not in any way uh, flout any laws uh, or any um, uh, what, you, what one might call any morals or anything like that. So that the court could apply customary law with regard to, to a dead body. Where do you place the dead body? And they said that in accordance with them is the clan which made the decision where to bury the body. They couldn't do anything about the, the property because that property was dealt with under the, the, under the uh, Succession Act and therefore Mbui uh, had every right. The, the clan could not even enter to the, that, that property, but they could take the body. And that was, that was the difficulty. Part of the nonsense of law. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, so we have a question. We have quite a, quite a number here. Yeah. So how does the law deal with a parent who categorically puts it in writing that a particular child should not inherit his property? Yes. Well, again, uh, first of all, it depends on what kind of property it is. For instance, if it is a piece of property that comes from an inherited piece of property, even if, you, if the, 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 the testator writes that, it will not be enforced. Because the law that applies there is the law of the area in which you come from. 
But if it is property that is purchased, I come from Busia, and I have, we have land in Busia. I couldn't write that about my child in Busia. But I might be able to write that about my child in Nairobi, a property that I have purchased. I may be able to say, no way should this child pass on to the other one. But having said that also, the court in this country, under Section 26, could look into this situation and see what is the problem. And if the problem is that there is a disability of the child, then the court could very well say, you know, out of this property, we will hive up so much so that we can deal with this child. Do you see what I mean? So that it's no longer just it, the law has, in this country, has become a little wider. It gives the, the courts um, some power to intervene where the, the, the testator, the person who has drawn up the will, has gone out of the question. For instance, if the, the, the testator said, no one in my family should inherit, and I'll pass it on to someone else, the court could very well come in and say, no, you're not allowed to, to, uh, to do that to the living. So that's, that's where we have a, a difficulty with that, even though, uh, strictly speaking, you could theoretically do that, but the court can, in, can get under Section 26, the court could get in where the circumstances are such that it would be right and proper for the court to make such provision. Okay. Thank you for that. When writing a will, what percentage should be given to the surviving spouse? And uh, secondly, what if a spouse is not transparent about all his or her property and the other spouse learns about it from other sources when he's long gone? <laughs> well, that, first of all, I, I think as to when writing a will, what percentage? Well, that's really, it's really up to the testator. Um, but, but, but you see, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to put this across to, to us, that we grow up with our families, and I speak maybe more to men than to women, even though the women as well. We come up together, and somehow, when we're passing on, we treat our spouses as if they were tenants in our home. I think that's totally wrong. I have had difficulties of understanding why, as we grow in our families and we buy things, why anything that we have has to be in my name. I don't see how that, because remember, the greatest legacy we leave behind is not things. The greatest legacy is the ministry we have for our, to our children. I cannot understand why, for instance, if I go, people will say, oh, you know, that's Fred's property. That's Fred. No, none of the properties that we have is in my sole name. None. And it's not that everybody's contributed to it. I may have put a lion's share of it. I may have put it myself. But none of them is in my property name. And I'm saying this openly because my wife can hear you, I'm sure. And none of them is in a property. Because I don't, I think we have a responsibility to hold on to that and to provide for them. The only possible reason you might not have for doing that would be for other legal reasons. But even then, you provide for them so that you don't have to get to a point where you have to think, oh, what would be my, my, the, uh, my, uh, what kind of uh, percentage should I give it to her? You see, there are ways you can hold property together without endangering each other, if you see what I mean. For instance, property can be held jointly. In other words, if one dies, 
then that property completely goes to the, to the other. Or the property could be held in co-ownership. In other words, you both have, you have each have half share of it. So that if I pass on, then what is left is my, my wife's share together with my share, which is now can be distributed elsewhere. That way I protect the children against uh, an errant or rogue wife. So that, and that can happen, a wife or a husband, where you, you uh, the wife dies, the husband goes off, does all sorts of things with other people, and leaves, and the, the, the children are suffering. You can do that by getting into co-ownership. So you can look at your properties and see, here we'll have co-ownership, here we'll have joint ownership. But you do not cut anybody out. So that at the end of it, when you are working out a will, your, only work a will, your, only, your will only relates to the part of, of the estate which belongs to you. And it's important to do that. Because I've seen situations where uh, the one parent has died and the other, after some time, has uh, established other associations and they've gone off and those other associations have caused the, the surviving parent to sell property, to leave the children destitute and to go off with these other people and sometimes these other people then disappear. So it's very important for you to think about it in that way so that you know that you provide for your person, not when you die, but while you're still alive, so that uh, that is never said to be a problem. So co-ownership is one way. And if I, I don't see, for instance, if you have two cars, why both have to be in my name? Why should they? And I think if we think about it that way, then we see the responsibility that God gives to us as his children in the way in that we deal with our family. I don't know whether that's a, an answer to that question, but I hope it does. Okay. So for gift intervals, does one move documents of ownership to person chosen, or is this done after death? The, the, sorry, the doc, document for, of ownership? For the gift intervals. Sorry, could you say it again, please? Gift. Yes, gift. Yeah. Does one move documents of ownership to the person chosen, or this is done after death? Uh, again, that, that very much depends on how one, one does it. A gift in survivors uh, doesn't have to be given while you're still alive. It is the actual gift in survivors is made you are alive, but it can take effect after you're dead. So that because there are times you've got to be responsible and you've got to look at your children. There are people, if you give them certain properties, they'll destroy them. Because you just got to look at them and see how best to, to do it. And sometimes people, uh, you could assign a property, uh, you, gift, you give gift into survivors to my son, Nkrubah or somebody, and, but he doesn't know, and you build capital out of that property, which is Nkrubah's only. And they will know it when you're passing on. It will pass on to them. But there are times, there are situations in which you might, you, you, could, you could actually build, you could pass on the property when the person is still alive to see how they can build up, uh, you can have partnerships with your, uh, your family so that you can build up uh, um, abilities and, and uh, proficiencies uh, so that the person then learns. One of the ways in which, take the Indian community. No, they do that a lot. The families get together, they start a business, and they join, the parents get into partnership with their own children, and soon enough, the children, one of the children goes off with one, with one strand of business and the other. And that's a kind of succession planning, where you're building up uh, 
abilities and, and uh, uh, proficiencies uh, in, in a particular area because you've seen one child who's able to do it and you, you, they start building up and then soon enough you hive off that for them. So that's something you, 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 could, you could try and do. Not hold on to it until you're dead. Uh, it does create problems, even at the best of times, to hold on to things until you're dead. You are 80 and you're still struggling to hold on to, to this and that, the other, waiting for it to be distributed at your death. That can be a problem. Okay. Is it advisable to let your spouse to know what you have written in the will before they die? Or what impact can this bring to the family? Yeah. Well, I, I think that, you see, the wills can be done individually or it can, it can be done together. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, we did a will together, uh, my wife and I, some time ago. We need to, re to look at it again. But, but also wills depend whether you're doing it together or separately. It will depend very much on what you have. There are certain things that I might want only my wife to hold. Uh, and there are certain reasons why you might want only your spouse to hold that and not, not, not you for legal reasons. So it's in sometimes problem tax problems and things like that when you're doing your tax, uh, uh, tax planning, you take that into account uh, because holding property has its, its goodness, but of course sometimes it could create uh, tax difficulties later. So the best way, you know, how, who holds the property and why. And depending on how you've held the property, then you can, hold, you can either have a joint uh, will or not, or have separate wills. It just depends. You have properties, out, sometimes people have property outside the country. And uh, in, in, in that outside the country may be possible only to hold it in one individual's name then it's only that individual who can then um, pass it on uh, to the, uh, do it, do the will relating to that property. So depending on what kind of property you're holding and what kind of risk you're managing, then you, you could decide whether you have a joint or a separate, uh, a separate will. But can they disclose their will to their spouse? Again, yeah, why not? I mean, it just depends. You know, you've got to be, you, we've got to be as, uh, as, as wise as doves. Because sometimes, you know, necessarily, you don't, I don't see why uh, you should keep secrets. There really shouldn't be any reason why you should keep secrets. The will isn't so as to, the other, to keep the other one not knowing what's happening. The will is just meant is an is a is an is a mechanism by which you are passing on to the other to the other side. There's no reason why you should keep things secret. Of course, there are, we're, we're, you know very well that there are circumstances in which, when you when your spouse knows that this is what you're doing, they they could easily give you a, a full meal of poison. <laughs> Or you know, or, or something like that. There are people who do that, obviously, uh, and but we're not talking about people like that, because if you're if you are living in those circumstances, where you have a hopeful dinner of, of uh, poison, then different different considerations come into being. I think, generally speaking, here we're talking about a generally open uh, um, family. And I would hope that in, in a Christian families such as we are, we shouldn't really be having, should have an open relationship. So they're not keeping secrets from each other. Uh, not making, uh, we're, not, we're not running a drug ring at the back there, and, and so your wife doesn't know anything about it. I think that's, that's I'm hoping that that's what we're talking about. Of course, where, where you're in a situation where it's very different, then different considerations come into being. Yeah, just to, Senior Counsel, just to pick up on that. Uh, we have families where, for example, a husband has put the mother, the husband has put the mother as the beneficiary yeah. and the children only. So the family was doing okay, 
But now in an event where now the husband needs to share that will with the wife, I don't know what kind of family will be left after that. <laughs> What's your take on that? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I mean obviously, uh, one, one of the things, of course, discretion is always a very important thing. Whether you di disclose anything to, to others or not, it takes discretion. It takes wisdom. So that I can't, I, it, it, you have to be very careful about going to your children, for instance, and saying to them, you know, I've left, I've left you a thousand pounds, or I've left that house to you. What is the effect of that to your family, between the children? So you've got to know, it's not that you're keeping a secret from them, but you're being, uh, you, you, you are being wise in the way that you, uh, you deal with it. In the same way, I think one can apply that same principle, that even though you're, if uh, there are, the reason you have a will is so that it's not broadcast everywhere. If, you, if, if that's what you're supposed to do, then you should do the will and then pin it on, your, on, your, on the board in the house for everybody to see. But you don't do that. And you don't do that because it's, it may be wise not to disclose that information at that time until maybe you've gone. So it's important, I think, um, that um, how you, there are no uh, fast, fast rules or hard rules as to when you disclose things to people. But there are, it takes the wisdom of the testator. You have to think about it as what you really want to happen, um, particularly when you're not there. You've always got to think about, when you're there, things are not, are not the same. But when, you, when you're away from there, then things can get pretty rot rotten. So you, in that basis, you've got to decide how you let your people know what what they should have. Sometimes, that's why even in the gift intervivals, you may not tell them what they are. But there are times when, after you've done a gift intervivals at a certain level, having seen what your people are like, you might say, take this, just like you would do uh, dur during, we've had to do that sometimes in, in our family, where we've, we've uh, had some things for, we held some things, and then in the course of the, the time we've told one of the children, Run with this. What is this? Now that's in a sense a distribution. They know that you distribute it to them. And they run with it, and then you, you go on to someone else. So, so I think it's a, it's a difficult question. The, um, the circumstances of the family are like. And that we really must ask God for, for wisdom and not act uh, impetuously without, without thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, in the event of uh, a divorce, so you have a first wife, and then you divorce, you marry another one, and then you have children with that one. Um, you, is the first wife entitled to any of the wealth that the man has? Yes. Of the, of the, f the first wife? Yes. Yes. I, usually, when you have a divorce, particularly if it's a divorce in court, there will be provisions. Uh, there will be claims and what are called ancillary claims in a divorce. And the court will rule in connection with those ancillary claims, uh, which relate to property and the division of property uh, uh, that you held, you may have held together or you may have held separately. But as a consequence of that divorce, the court will make um, uh, a ruling on that. Uh, then, of course, it, that, there is not you distributing it, it's the court that distributes it. Yes, it's very likely that that, that person could be, it will be based on, when it comes to divorce, it will be based on contribution. And the contribution here doesn't mean contribution fin financially, it might mean contribution in every other sense, emotionally, um, whatever, you know, and, and uh, the court will, taking those, all those factors into account, then make a distribution. Thank you. Oh, yes, yes, Pastor. Yes. Uh, 
So there's been a divorce. So the, there's been a divorce. Yes. And um, the wife has been, you know, there's been a division of wealth. Uh, then this man remarries again, and they generate another wealth with this the new wife, yeah. and they have a family. At the point of death, can the first wife come back and claim this other wealth again? No, okay. no, no, no. Then that, that's sorry that I didn't understand that. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. The the second the second marriage would have no, uh, or the first uh, spouse would have no claim to the uh, to the property or any wealth acquired uh, in the second marriage, or which would moved into the second marriage by the court. Okay. Just a bit of a twist on that. So, um, what if there is a death? Additional marriage, then there's a death, and there's some property, and then there's uh, the guy remarries, um, and so what happens to some of the property that was collected before the death to this new wife? Is there a claim on inheritance to the new wife? No. Okay. Let me just uh, understand what you're saying. You're saying that there is a marriage, mm -hmm. and you've made, uh, you've uh, acquired some property in that marriage. Then there's a divorce. Or a death. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Death. Oh, death. Yeah. And then there is a subsequent. Now, now no. You see, what what would happen is once when there is a uh, there is a um, the death of the person or who the the testator, the person who whose property it is, then you have to do. If there's a will, for instance, you have to go through the whole probate and distribute the 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 the. the the estate in accordance with the will, or if there's no will in accordance with the rules of intestacy. The second marriage after the, the, the death doesn't have automatic right to that wealth. No, because that is an estate that has come to an end, it's got to be, got to be distributed, and then the second marriage would have to, uh, would have to continue with their own wealth, so to speak, or part of the wealth that is assigned to the, whoever is getting married to her or him. So, that's, so there's no automatic transfer of wealth from the earlier marriage into the second one. Even Thank though there could be, but it's not automatic. Thank you. In the event of um, a man, a husband has inherited property from, their, from his parents, um, can the wife claim proceeds of that inheritance or the way to get them from their own parents? No, what she can. Uh, she could. I mean, if if, uh, if the, the husband has inherited property from, from, from his parents, it becomes his property. And when the wife and the husband are together, then when they die, depends on whose estate it is. And if it's the estate of the husband, she d he dies intestate, then they go through the whole intestate thing, and the wife will have will have uh, uh, part of that in accordance with the rules of intestacy that I talk about. Cool. So they have they can claim mistaken. Yes, they could have a claim. Yes. All right. So pr please provide more information on discretional trust, and how does one set it up? The one sessional. Yes, it's called discretion, discretional trust. That's what is. Sorry. The trust. The trust. 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 Oh, sorry. Not clear. I really understand. It. Trust. It's a discretional trust. Oh, discretionary trust. Well, a discretionary trust is a trust like any other. You know, a trust is uh, you can set up a trust which is a mechanism by which you can move property which may initially have belonged to you into a trust. And that trust is run by trustees. Those trustees have the legal ownership of that property. But for the benefit of the trust, for, for the beneficiaries of that trust on your account. In other words, I could, I could buy my glasses 
and, I, and they have a certain value. And then I would pass them on to, to trustees. And I say, could you look after that, that trustee for me? And the income from that glasses shall be for the benefit of my children or my grandchildren. Now, when you want to do that, then you, you create a trust, a simple it's a drawing up a, what is called a trust deed. And the trust deed will set out first the objectives or the objects of that trust. And secondly, how the, the, the property of the trust can be used, how the property of the trust can be, uh, can be invested, because usually the trust will be, uh, it's just like if we, if we decided here at Ongatongai that we create a, a, a trust in a way of a provident fund. We want to make sure, uh, we, we want to, uh, sorry, not provident fund, an endowment fund. We want to have an, a fund by which we can, we, we, can we can put some money together, put it in, in, a, in an account for it to uh, gain some income, and that income is used, say, for the children of, of NBC on Gatarongai. So to do that, you do a trust deed, which will set out the, the objectives of that trust deed, set out how the property is to be uh, run, set out the rules as to how uh, the property of that can be distributed to, the, to whoever the ben beneficiaries are. So that the one who set up the trust has no control over it. That is held by someone else. But the only control he or she has is what is called letters of wishes. In other words, they will give, apart from the trustees, will give the trustees a letter which says to them that I, will want, I would want this money to be used to, to benefit children at Ongata Rungai who have these sort of properties. So you have letters of wishes. So the trust is in that sense. Those children cannot go to the trustees and say, give us that money because it's not theirs. Nor can the, the, the man who's put up the, uh, the man or woman who's put up that money go to the trustees and say, okay, give me that money. It's not his. No, the tr trustees who are holding it cannot say it's our money. It's for the benefit of others. So the reason you do that is to avoid the fighting that comes in sometimes in, in a home where everybody wants this, that, and the other. You kept the money aside, you benefit them, but they do not have it. A lot of people have done this where they have children who, are, who have become uh, alcoholics or drug addicts, and they are, and they are really no good in many ways, but they require support from you as a parent. And so you create that so that he, you are sure that that boy or that girl is looked after and he's not out in the street. But at the same time, that boy is not taking that money and going and using the same thing for the street. And you also are kept insulated from that. See what I mean? That, that's what a discretion is all about. It's called discretionary trust because the trustees are supposed to be acting on their own discretion at their own discretion as to whether to give or not to give. And to look at the person and see whether I should give them five shillings today or not. Or should I, instead of giving him five shillings, go and pay uh, a place where he can, he can get food from? You know, that sort of thing. That's the idea. Yes. If the trustees go rogue, yes, you have a need to uh, way of revoking it. OK. Mm. So most marriages in Kenya uh, come with stay. So how does succession look like for such the can we stay marriages? That's where you have the intestacy rules. The can you stay really creates a dependency. Um, uh, not, not really marriage. It's a dependency. And uh, you can go under Section 26 to court to try and get a bit of a dependency back to you. So you're, you're, you could very well create a situation where you are entitled to some, uh, some part of the estate. Okay. Yeah. So if a father dies without saving anything, and a mother is left with the properties, can a mother have the right to give out the properties herself? After going through, you see, once, once the, any person 
in the family dies, you have to go through a process of, uh, uh, of ensuring that the estate of that person has been dealt with, either by, by will, if there's a will, if not by will, then by statistics, and become, you have uh, uh, administrators of that estate, could be the mother, or could be someone else, usually are two. And when they do that, they collect the estate of that person, then distribute it in accordance with the law. So that it's not just the mother who decides. It may be, because she may very well be the, one of the administratrix, but it may be someone else appointed by the court to do that. And then the, the distribution will be done in accordance with the rules of intestacy that are found in the Succession Act. Okay. So given that oral will is valid for only three months, what advice will you give a parent who isn't willing to write a will? Who's not willing to write a will? Yes. <laughs> well, I... Maybe they're giving it orally, but it's valid for three months. So mm. after every three months, they say something different. So... <laughs> so. <laughs> that's a, well, I, I, there, of course, there are people who don't necessarily like to write wills because some people feel that uh, when they write wills, it's, just the, it's a death. Uh, <laughs> they think they're, they're just going to die. I don't know why they think that, because they are going to die at some point. <laughs> but, but the thing is, if a person is not willing uh, to write a will, uh, there's a way in which you could probably persuade them to do a gift in survivors. I've done that sometimes with people. Um, or uh, create a discretionary trust. Because there it doesn't say anything about your dying or uh, uh, even though it's, a, it's, it's something that will happen eventually. So I, I could do that. Because I think I'm, you, the people need to know the consequences of not making clear what their, their, their wishes are can be catastrophic. And that's what people don't realize that. You can get whatever property you may have can be wasted with lots of lawyers there just eating it and nobody else. The, the family are in, in con constant problems. And finally, all the, the estate could be wasted. And the people for whom should be a benefit will be out in the streets. So I think it's, it's a matter of trying to explain to them that uh, it's in their best interest either to write a will or to find a mechanism by which the transfer of the property can be done uh, reasonably and uh, for the benefit of the family. So, okay. Prior to marriage, the property that has been bought prior to marriage, will you advise that they now put it and a family name, or how do they go about such? Whether, whether or not you do that depends on what property it is, because as soon as you move property, then you have other taxes to pay. You have uh, various stamp duty to pay and uh, things like that. So you've got to, to think about what property is it that you, 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 want, to, you want to transfer. I. Uh, I personally, I, I, I would say even though if, for instance, you, you've acquired property before you got married and you want to ensure that your spouse, and particularly you're talking about spouse presumably, your spouse has an interest in the, in the, in the, in the property, you can do so without, without, uh, um, without having to transfer it. There are mechanisms, there are ways in which you could have your own spouse, could, could, you could agree for your spouse to put in, to put um, a restraining order on the property. For instance, husbands, for instance, sometimes husbands with their business interests, they could easily uh, mortgage the matrimonial home. And the, the, th the first time the wife knows what has happened is when the, the people are coming to sell the matrimonial home. So sometimes it may be a good thing to agree, this is our matrimonial home. One of the things that we agreed when, when we, got, we got married is that our matrimonial home will never be used as security for any borrowing. None. Uh, we agreed that. 
Now, if you've agreed that and the, the, the house is in my name, because uh, then I would ask, I would rather, rather than transfer it to her, I'll ask her to put a restraining order on the property so that there is a, there's a caveat or a caution to the property. We've agreed, so she puts a caution so that I can't, in a, in a situation of weakness, uh, mortgage it. Because you try and mortgage it, you'll find there's a caution there because your wife has done it. There's a, it's true that under the law, the wife has an automatic right to, to a matrimonial house. So that if you're going to sell it, she could easily go to court and stop it. But rather than go through all that, get her to put a caution on the property. You agreed together from the very beginning. Right. Thank you. Sometimes we have our siblings asking for assistance so often. Can they, be, can they claim to be dependent eventually? Who? Our siblings. <laughs> no, a sibling should, be, should not be our dependents. I mean, they, they, our sibling uh, uh, have a right of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of uh, bequest by law. So they don't have to be dependents. It, the dependent is where a person who does not have an automatic right becomes entitled by dependency. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it doesn't happen to your own children. Uh, even if your, your own children become, you know, they, they, they can inherit just by virtue of being your children. But you only go for dependency where a person is not automatically uh, one who can, uh, who can uh, inherit from you. Okay. Yes, there's a pastor. Uh, does it matter how long that person has been depending on you for them to qualify as a dependent? Uh, well, I, actually the period is, is certainly a factor is not the automatic factor, okay. uh, but, but it is certainly a factor. Because if somebody had just been with you for a week, uh, they probably can't, can't possibly say they are dependents. Mm. It, dependency has the longevity, mm. uh, the, the, the whole uh, length, but also the substance okay. by how, you are crea how you've treated that individual mm. in, your, in, in your home and etc. As long as it can be shown that they have acquired a quality of, of existence in your home, mm. that makes them more than just a passing by. Okay. Yeah. So in the, what happens if there's a joint property and one dies? How do one go about it? Joint property? Yes, and then one spouse dies. Well, joint property uh, then reverts completely to the person who's the joint owner, completely, uh, which is different from co-ownership. Co-ownership is where uh, when one of, the other, one of the parties dies, then half the, um, the, the, the value of the property is with the surviving party. But the other half becomes the estate of the party who's passed on, and that can be dealt with separately. Okay. So it goes back to the surviving partner? Uh, no. The, it's when you have joint ownership and you own, uh, if you are jointly own this piece of property, then when one dies, then the ownership of that property completely reverts to the other who survived. When you are co-owners of that property, when one dies, then half of that property remains with the surviving partner, but half of it is part of the estate, which can then be distributed in accordance with the rules of intestacy or the will or something like that. Okay. Yeah. Maybe to just ask, in case uh, maybe the shares are not 50-50, maybe it is 70, because it is co-ownership anyway. Mm. So does it have to be 50-50? No. It does not have to be 50-50. You can be 70-30 or, or, or 99 and 1. 
but, but generally, it's difficult to own uh, like landed property, uh, like 99 percent. You can, if if it is property that's owned by a company, then you can own 99 percent of it because you can own shares in it. So the property is held by a company. Uh, take for instance our home. Our home is held by a company, a company which is made up from my wife and I when we were quite quite, quite young, and we were both. Full owners of that of the of that com of that company, so we could easily decide to sell and buy those shares within the the house. It's one in house, but then she then can have fifty percent, sixty percent, or I can can have a hundred percent. So that's the but but if you're owning it as individuals, it's difficult to uh, if you're co ownership, then it's very likely to be half and half. Okay, in the event when a court rules for, say, division of property and uh, one party is unwilling to sign for the court ruling, how do they handle that? Well, the court can, can, can do the, the signing itself. The court can order that if the one party is not willing to sign within a particular time, then the registrar of the, of the court can sign. Can sign on their behalf? Yes. And therefore, they can pass on the the whatever interest that is being passed on. Okay. So in what, in, what, in which circumstances will a trust be better than a gift intervival? Well, I, a gift intervival, I suppose, gives, gives whoever is being gifted an automatic and uh, a full right in it. A trust doesn't give that person the right of ownership. A trust only gives the right of use. See what I mean? In the, in the sense that if, if I have, uh, um, and that's why I give you the, the, the example of an errant child who's, who, whenever you give him a few shillings, he'll end up drinking Muratina. Now, if you, if you have a person like that, but he's your child, and you feel that you, they have to be uh, looked after. I, I, I can give you an example, a real example. I had a, 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 one of my colleagues, uh, one of my partners some years ago, had a brother who was a drug addict and he was in a complete mess. And um, they had property in, in Karen. So what they, they created a trust which then collected rent from that property and since they were entitled to half and half because he was a brother, they, the trust invested that property, that, that income, uh, by sending it to a Salvation Army uh, place in, in Australia, uh, a, a, a rehabilitation center of some sort, and took the brother there. And they ensured that the brother had everything, clothing, food, uh, everything that he needed. But he would not give him money. So he had no right to the money. He couldn't go to the trustees and say, I want some money. No, he couldn't. But he had everything that he needed uh, were provided by the trust. So that's, that's where uh, a trust would be an important one to have. OK. So one is asking, what do I do when there are so many boys in the family and they tend to harass me and I've been given an inheritance and they are threatening me to the point of death? Boys? Yes. Well, that's probably because they, have, they haven't uh, distributed the wealth. Because if they have done, then each of them should have their own uh, right. I've, I've always uh, tried to encourage uh, people who are going through this whole process of distribution of wealth, that the best thing is to do it as quickly as possible. And if you can't all run it, distribute it, everybody goes their own way. And I think that that probably is a situation in which uh, the distribution is not complete. So, but it, it's, it's not her fault, for example, that mm. the parents decide they give her the entire inheritance and leave out their brothers. So how, do, how does she deal with that? <laughs> Well, that's, uh, that could be hard. Well, unfortunately, it's the kind of thing that uh, people can go to court under Section 26 
and say we've been dispossessed completely. And that's it's not on. And the court could very well say that a portion of this will be given to these people. Uh, that is not the problem of the, the, the beneficiary, it's the problem of the father. So what advice do you give to the beneficiary? Wisdom. I think that if the beneficiary has to be very wise, particularly if, if it's, uh, it's got to a point where they're being threatened in life, it might be a good thing to, to give something to, to them if it's possible. Uh, and then, you know, just like we all know, you know, if it's at all possible, live peaceably with all, all people. So I think that's what should be the, the thing that we're trying to do, to live peaceably with everyone. And if it does mean that you, you, you forego a bit of the wealth that has been given to you, one Um, so how do you put trustees in check so that they don't become rogue? Well, I mean, trustees have to give account of everything that they do. If you find that the trustees are going rogue, you can always take them out. Because the trustees are not, uh, they're not, uh, uh, you know, a god unto themselves. They have to they, because they trust, they have to do trust accounts. It's a, it's a very onerous job. Because you have to do trust accounts, you have to provide accounts every so often to show how this money is being used. Because if you, if you use it badly, then you, you run the risk of being prosecuted for it. So the trust, trustee's job is not as easy as it sounds. So you can, in fact, take them into problems. Okay. In your experience, have you experienced an individual who goes behind their spouse to register a different will that is contrary to what they had agreed as a family? Yes. How do you? Yeah, do you do? there have been situations where a person has, uh, has gone and registered a completely different will. The, 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 then what would happen in those, in those circumstances would be the court will have to determine what will prevails. Um, and you see, if, for instance, the, the person you have, you have uh, in your will distributed um, part of the estate, which is joint, for instance, and then you go around and do another will that acts as if that estate is only, is only personal, then you're likely to be making a mess of it. It's, it's highly unlikely that the court will, will, will uphold that. Okay, so, um, so which one overrides the other? Is it the current one which he had gone behind their back or the one which was joint? <laughs> the general principle is that the latter will will always um, prevail, but only in certain circumstances. If the latter will seeks to, to abrogate what it cannot abrogate, then it, it will not in any way affect the earlier will at all. Uh, so it just depends on what, what it is that you're passing on or seeking to pass on. Um, if, if, if you're trying to, uh, to pass on uh, stuff that c couldn't be possibly passed on by you, then obviously it, it doesn't make any effect at all on the previous uh, will. Previous will remains sacrosanct. It's where you are making a will relating to your own personal property, then that will might, might very well uh, you know, be prevail above the previous one. It might, just depends on the circumstances. Okay. okay. So it seems like a gift in survival is better than a will. Should it be registered? Does it have a legal document? with witnesses, it is, how does it go? Uh, well, I mean, uh, gifted rivals, uh, now, it says it seems that it's better than a will. Well, it's it better than a will in certain circumstances, yes. Uh, certainly, it's better than a will. But you can't say generally that it's better than a will. I've, 
I have seen, though, that in, in my experience, that seeing the way that people behave uh, amongst us, sometimes I've found that the gift in Viva is much, probably a lot better than having people having to fight forever. Uh, we, we've had sta states which have been fighting for 30 years, 40 years, and th throughout that time, many of the people who should have, should have benefited have died. So I, I think in those circumstances, I think this is ludicrous to have a, 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 a will like that. So I, I think in such circumstances, yes, a gift into my voice is a good one. Um, depending on the circumstances, one always has to look at the circumstances. So I, I, w I would say yes, but before I say yes as such, I would say take advice. Go and see a, a, a practitioner to look at the, your circumstances, because it just depends on the circumstances. Your circumstances, whether they, they admit of a gift to the Bibles, or maybe you could do this, and you could do a mix and match. You could say, I, I'll do my will, will deal with this, that, and property, and I'll, I'll do gifting on this, that, and property. So it's not, it's not cast iron that you must do one or the other. It just depends on what the circumstances are. So it's good to take advice. Okay, and what's the process of uh, acquiring your gift after the death of the person? The gift? Yes, how do you, what's the process of getting it now that you've been gifted? Well, once the gift is be, uh, has been done, there'll be, a gift in a, in a, in, there'll be a gift document, right? There'll already be a gift document which has been, uh, has been done, and possibly along with that, there will be, if it were landed property for instance, there will already be a caution uh, registered against the title. So that when, when it's over, the caution will have been registered in your favor anyway. And you have the, the, the document, gift document, which you have then given. And, and that's it. It's, uh, it's transferred. Okay. Just like you do in a, in a will, for instance. Okay. Yeah. So what happens if the oral will differs from the written will? The written will prevails. Which one? Okay. In the, in the extent that the oral will was recorded. So you have a recording. Yes, the, the, the written will will prevail anyway, even if it was recorded or, you know, uh, or if you have an audio recording, uh, it, will, it will prevail, provided it is not, if it, uh, it depends on what came first. If you had a written will and then you have an oral will subsequently, yes. That would normally not override the written will, except whether in the oral will it says explicitly that my will of so and so is hereby disregarded. Yeah, abrogated. Okay. Then you must do that. And when it's when that's done, then you have three months within which to to ensure that all that is done. So, uh, in the oral, even if they have to state categorically that. The court needs to disregard the written will. That's yes, you have to. If, if it's an oral will, and it's an oral will which is supposed to be abrogating an earlier written will, then you have to be absolutely explicit of what that will is and when it was made and by whom. Okay. The recording. And then, of course, the, I should have made it too simplistic because the, the recording is also a problem. Because we all know how it is to, to do kinds of interesting recordings. So the, the recording, just the fact that you've recorded it, doesn't make it real. You've got to go and go to, to court and have evidence. You, and you could be cross-examined on it. And it could be shown that you did some Photoshop somewhere or, or did some, <laughs> some crazy uh, interesting work. So it, it, it is not as simple and as straightforward as that. That's why written wills prevail, most of, generally. All right. In the event of uh, an inevitable death of the whole family, how does succession now take place? In the event of what? A death of the entire family. Dying? Yes. Well, you see, if, if everybody dies and there's no one to take, then everything reverts to the state, the consolidated fund. Everything goes. It's 
it's uh, declared what in law is called bona vacantia. It's declared bona vacantia and becomes part of the estate because it's taken over by the state. But that does is only if there is no one to, to claim. And there, uh, and there are processes by which this, uh, this property is declared bona vacantia. It's not just one individual comes up and says, oh, well, there's nobody here, so I'll take this. No, there's a process by which the state will declare a property bona vacantia so that there is, that there is a transparency and accountability. And quite often, if it were landed, then it would have to go to parliament as well. Okay. Mm. So how do you inherit properties that maybe have no title? For example, it's land and it has no title and it has been left to you. Well, a lot of the land in, in the rural areas doesn't have titles, you know? But you, st you still inherit it. Uh, you still inherit the, the land. The question is, uh, after that, what happens? And there's a there's connection, and, and there, there, there are uh, attempts to ensure that all land is registered in the country. So that's a matter of property, yeah. Thank you so much. I think we are done with the, the written ones. Let me get the oral ones. <laughs> Thanks. Um, one follow-up to the question that was before. Uh, what if either by a gift or by a title you um, have uh, a beneficiary or, a, or an heir, but that heir is either unable or unwilling to take up um, that uh, part of the state that has been allocated to them? What happens in that process? Unable or unwilling? unwilling. Yeah. Well, it goes on to the next. You see, there's a priority list. There's a priority list. So if, if one... Uh, doesn't is not able to take then the next individual on in the priority list takes uh, if for instance the the, the parents uh, have been gifted some land by their own parents and they're not able to take then their grandchildren can then take yeah it's just okay all right any other question pending banning we all good in matter successions. We know what to do <laughs> now. It's clear. The process is clear. Whether it's, I apologize if I'm not as as clear as I should be. It's it's quite a convoluted convoluted uh, subject. This. Okay. In Yamisho Wangu, it's about um, April this year. Um, one about, of the about what? Sorry. April April this year. Yes. One of the key speakers in the coming men's conference is called Hakimi ZH. Mm -hmm. He decided that 80% of his wealth goes to the mother and 20% is only shared with his wife. And so when they wanted to divorce, the court realized that the two share only 20%. In your practice of law, how would you describe such a situation and more so for the wife, what should she do? Because that 80 is already with the mother legally and only 20 is shared among the two. Well, the first question I would want to know is how was it legally 80%? Because the, the, the problem is that uh, with, with wealth, particularly where there is no will, is an intestacy. Then if there is an intestacy, then the rules set out in the Succession Act work. And if the rules of the Succession Act work, then the mother would not get 80%. It will be the spouse who will first be the first line of intestacy, and they will, under 40%, get 40% of the life interest of, of the home and uh, have 100% uh, uh, ownership of the the, the personal property, and uh, the rest will be shared in accordance with the rules of the intestacy. So that, that uh, um, and a, a declaration like that doesn't sound to have any, any force of law. Yeah. Yes. Okay, praise God. Amen. Praise God again. Amen. 
I know I'm young to ask this question. Uh, from all the questions, there is a question that I've not heard. Yeah, please, please is, could you, could you speak a bit louder? I have a problem okay. hearing. I have my property, yeah. but I'm the only child. No brothers, no sisters. Parents died. With relatives, we don't get each other, or neither I was rejected. So where should I hand my property? I don't have kids. You get some parents. Say that again. You, you are an, 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 the oldest child. Yeah. I mean, not you, maybe. Yeah, I'm the you only are. child. You're the only child. Yeah, no yeah. brother, yeah. no sisters. Right. Parents died. Yeah. R with relatives, we don't get each other. Or maybe I was rejected. Yes. Yeah. If so you're an orphan, if you're an orphan, yeah. you have no brothers, yeah. you're the only one. Yeah. Then the entire estate goes to you. Okay. The entire estate goes to you, and then it's up to you to, to distribute it as as you like. Does that does that make sense? That property is yours. Yeah. So you you are the one who decides how to distribute yes, it. Yes, the property is yours, you and uh, you you decide how it's going to be distributed after it passes on to you. Does, does that, does that, is that clear? Yo, I mean that I'm about to die. Yes. Yeah, so where should I hand my property? You're the only child. I'm the only child. Your parents have passed on. Yeah. And you have property. Yeah. And you're about to pass on. Yeah. And what, what's your question? Where should I hand my property? Well. That depends on you, doesn't it? I mean, it, it depends on how you then provide who do you want to leave it with. That's why I was saying about having vision. Who do you want to leave it with? Okay. Do you want to leave it with relatives or do you want to leave it with a friend? The, provided it's the kind of property that you can leave to a friend. Because not all properties you can leave to a friend. For instance, if it were, if it were a property that uh, you acquire by by the fact that you are a member of that community and if you've inherited it, it may be difficult for you to pass it on to someone else except people in that, in that circle. So it just depends on the kind of property it is. Okay. If it are flat in the city, for instance, you may be able to pass it on to a friend. Okay. Uh, not to a, you're un under no obligation to pass it on to a relative. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other? So the question of dealing with the, maybe the myth of writing a will for Africans, how do we handle it? Because uh, Maressa here might be feeling like he's too young to write a will. And uh, <laughs> how do you deal with those myths for us as Africans? Yeah. Well, it's not too young to write a will. A, a lot of people feel that you only write a will because you have something to pass out. Sometimes it's good you, you write a will only to talk to, to give people a direction as to how they ought to deal with you when you have left. I don't think there's anything wrong to write a will about. But I think we ought to realize, not to get this mindset of wills, because wills is just a, a testamentary disposition. It's a, just a way by which you dispose what you have. But there are other methods of disposing what you have. And so you've got to look at your circumstances and see whether the way to do it is by way of a will or by some other way. And I've uh, already mentioned it uh, to you. So sometimes when people have difficulties writing wills uh, because they feel the wills have some connotation then find another way of doing it. And one of the ways is by distribution, by, by uh, um, uh, uh, discretionary trust, or by, uh, as I've, I've said before, uh, by uh, uh, gifts into vivos, or by outright gifting while you're still alive. So I think all those are available. And the, but the way to do it is not to say, I'm going to, to see a a lawyer to write a will. No, I would rather say I'm going to see a lawyer to see how best to deal with the property that I have. And uh, it's never 
too early. Of course, remember, if, if you're under 18, you can't make a will. You have to be uh, a person who is, is an adult. And if you have problems, mind problems, you have to be in law, they say you have to be compost mentis. You have to be a person who understands what is being done. Uh, if you're not like that, you can't make a will. Uh, and so all those things you, you, you will be considered when you go and see a lawyer. They'll speak to you, they'll find out what you are, where you are, and listen to you. And if you think that you, you need more a psychiatrist than a lawyer, they'll send you there. See? So, so that's... So that's uh, I was giving generalities, but remember, not, not everybody can make a will. Not everybody can make a will. And particularly when you're very ill, for instance, you could make a will, but the likelihood of that will being abrogated are very high because it's possible that you are not of the right frame of mind to make a will. And particularly when you're making the will in such circumstances that you're likely to have been put under pressure, either psychological or physical, by other people. And when somebody's very ill, then you know, they could do some crazy things. You could find that the person is so ill that uh, decide to give everything to, her, to, the, to the nurse who's looking after him. Uh, you start, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, so it's, it's things like that and factors like that which have to be taken into account. All right? Thank you so much. Let's appreciate our legal <laughs> senior counsel. Thank you. You may have your seat. Uh, let me invite... Uh, Brother Nimrod, to just come and give a vote of thanks to our speaker uh, for this day before I, inv I invite Pastor after that. Wow, three hours standing and um, talking about succession. Thank you so much, um, Wakili. We've really learned a lot. I know most of us, we, we don't have, personally, I don't have a will. Uh, let, me, let me not say most of us. Uh, let me talk about myself. Um, so thank you so much. We've really learned a lot. And um, I believe we will uh, make it practical um, in our uh, own situations. Um, so allow me to invite um, Irene. Uh, we have a small token, um, which um, just want just, just an appreciation, um, that's just a way of saying thank you for, for your time, uh, for your sacrifices, for your research, which you've, um, you did. And um, uh, above all, we just want to say God bless you um, in all uh, your businesses, your family, and uh, looking forward to hosting uh, you again. I'm sure uh, those of us who are watching online, um, uh, in the coming days or years, we will uh, seek for a second session so that we learn more and also benefit from your wealth of uh, experience. Irene, you can um, do the needful. Um, I, I know we don't have cameras. Maybe we can face the static one which is behind there, yeah. 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 Okay. Pastor Irene, you can uh, close for us with... Um. Thank you so much, Uncle Fred. Uh, wow, a lot, a lot, a lot we've learned today. Um, Elder Okonda, what does Second Kings chapter 20, verse 1 say? You have your Bible. It's okay. Just open it. <laughs> you know, you're looking at me as though I'm putting you to test. <laughs> you can stand and read it out from verse 1 and uh, actually 20 verse 1 only. Yes. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Amon, went to him and said, This is what the Lord 
<laughs> One of the things that um, uh, Dr. Ojambo has said is that we are afraid to put our houses in order because we think when we do that, we will die. And he has said, definitely, we will die. Whether it is today or in the next 20 or 40 years, there's a time that will come when we will all die. But it is beautiful that when that time comes, our house is in order. I read this scripture, and as I was thinking about it, you know, as he was teaching us, I actually wondered if uh, this wonderful prophet, prophet Ezekiah had put his out house in order. Because he had to plead with the Lord, you know? Uh, we always ask, if the Lord asks of, you, of your soul today, are you ready to go? He pleaded and he asked the Lord to please remember his years of service and all that. And the Lord was so gracious and added him 15 years. Okay, 15 years which he messed up, but he was given 15 years. Uh, because out of the 15 years, uh, someone was born who was the most wicked person we know. Uh, but we might not have that opportunity to plead for more years if we have praised the Lord. But now that we know, now that we have had this session today, let us put our houses in order. Okay? Let us just take time and put our houses in order. Um, I think women su suffer the most. So men, please protect your women. Uh, culture come knocking. Um, People come knocking, so many issues just show up. On that day, we hear there were other children, you know, that we didn't know. <laughs> There's a lot that really happened, but we have an opportunity to even come out clean and say, hey, Mama Watoto, you know, uh, beyond our two children, I have someone else somewhere. I think these are conversations that we can have, fight, cry, reconcile, and find a way forward and see how we can we can cover each other. Uh, Pastor Elder Okonda is looking at me and thinking, where? Uh, are you sure? <laughs> yeah, but may the Lord help us. But I want us to just take time and pray for families that are really going through a difficult time because the houses were not in order. Some of us are here and we are caught right in between the mess, you know? Um, some of us don't even know how to pray for our siblings or our relatives because we we are really caught in there and it's messy. If we can just go before the Lord and invite him to come into our messy situation, he's able to clean us up. He's able to just sort things out right for us. He's able to lead us into light, you know, because sometimes we feel we are really caught up in darkness. If you can just take time, bow your head, call on the Lord, um, pray for yourself, pray for someone you know who is in in such a situation. Hear us, O oh Lord, as we call on your name. Praying, Lord, concerning the situations in our lives, in our families, the many families that are represented here, Jehovah God. Our God and our Father, listen to our cries this afternoon. Every prayer that is being raised up to you in this congregation, Jehovah God, every heart that is being lifted up to you, this our Jehovah Lord Almighty. Lord Jesus, this is a hearty issue. Uh, it's one of the issues that has caused not only conflicts in families, but even death. Deaths in different families, Jehovah King of Glory. Families that we know of, families that we are coming from. We've seen how wrangles because of a succession um, uh, that have gone bad, or Lord, where there was no will, where there was no proper 
uh, uh, inheritance path for families, Lord. We've seen wrangles in our families, and some of us are caught up in the mess, Jehovah King of Glory. Father, you who created the universe, and your word tells us that in the beginning everything was formless, it was chaotic, and you are able to set order where there was no order. We invite you into our lives. We invite that order into our families. We invite that order into our situations, Jehovah God. Father, you who say that where you are, there is light and your light, and where your light is, darkness cannot exist. Lord, how I pray that would you come and shine your light in our situations, shine your light in our mess, Jehovah King of glory. Some of the questions that we've asked today, some are pertaining us and the situations that we are in, O oh Jehovah God, we are calling on your name. Use us as contact persons, Lord, to reach out to the extent of our families, Lord Jesus. We invite you. We invite you, Jehovah God. Would you come and take charge and take control of the situation? Have your way, dear Lord. Have your way in our lives. Lord Jesus, we pray for our heart to forgive. We pray even for a heart to let go. Lord Jesus, because some of this material wealth are costing us our lives, Lord. We pray that would you allow us to be able to let go where there is need for us to. For the sake of peace, your word tells us to see that we live in peace with one another. And Lord Jesus, the effort to live in peace is not easy. And especially when the people you live with do not know you. They are not believers. And you are the only person who knows the Lord. Father, how I pray that would you help us that in such circumstances, Lord, we'll make every effort to live peacefully with one another. Would you help us to forgive those who have really hurt us and instill wounds in us, some wounds, they keep hitting on the same wound over and over again. They keep testing our patience. They keep pushing us to the edge, Lord. Father, we pray that would you come and help us to be able to forgive them in the very same way that you forgave us, Lord Jesus. I pray for those in here who have court cases that have been running one year after another, they are tired and caught up in those court cases. Lord Jesus, would you come through for them, Jehovah, King of glory, that a decision will be made, their hearts will be set free, Jehovah God, and that they will be led to live their lives, Lord. And so, Father, in whatever situation we are in, would you come through for us? And so I commit you to him, who is able to do much more than we can think of or even imagine. To him who is able to sort out the things that are messy in your life. May the Lord come through for you. May he answer your prayer. And sometimes we, <laughs> and Lord forgive us, because sometimes we play victim, where yet we are the ones who are causing issues in our families. Yet we are the ones who are hurting others. Lord Jesus, may it be different with these brothers and sisters in here. That, Lord, they would not be the source of conflict in their families, but they may, may they be the people who are causing peace. Father, Lord, may we not be the one who, when the family wants to move forward, we are bringing in obstacles one after another. So would you help us, Lord, and forgive us, and forgive us, and even help us to have the, the strength to ask for forgiveness for they that we've hurt in the process. Lord Jesus, I pray for marriages that are here. We've talked about so many issues that can go wrong in marriages because of property. And some of them could be of our own causing. Some of them could be external, Lord. Father, Lord, may your shield be over every marriage in here. I pray over every child represented here, but also the children we are supposed to leave these properties to, Lord. Would you give us the strength to put our house in order so that when our time comes, 
People will not be caught up in mess, in a mess that we could have prevented. So Lord, come and have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. I think sometimes it really takes courage for us to examine ourselves and see if we are the ones who are causing issues, <laughs> you know, in our families. It's, it's very easy to point out, oh, this person is doing this to me and that. But sometimes it's good to just ask the Lord to search our hearts and help us to, to know if we are the one who are hurting our siblings, hurting the people around our life, and especially on this matter, our succession. So may the Lord help us. May he be with us. Uh, we've come to the end of our first session and I know you are tired and please I know we have football in the afternoon let me plead to every football lover we still have a session in the afternoon don't go home <laughs> um, so we will go down and have lunch and uh, after that we'll have an afternoon session is that okay so let me hand over to you Thank you. Let's appreciate uh, the pastor for that. Yes, also to appreciate uh, a group of people who had made this possible, um, the committee members of the fa uh, family enrichment. Maybe you can stand up so that we can be able to appreciate you. Wanakamati. Uh, Wanakamati, how? Thank you for, for the service uh, on behalf of our chairman who is not here. We just want to say thank you for your contribution for what you've done today. And so thank you so much, Senior Council, for the time that you've given us. I know that we've been refreshed and now we are knowledgeable on how to go about different issues mm -hmm. of our lives. So we may stand up and just share the words of grace, even as we heed to the instruction that Pasi has given. <laughs> At Akuna Kuenda, lunch will be there. Uh, I don't know whether it's there already, but if it's not there, you start with the fun activities that have been organized. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you and enjoy your afternoon. So we are going down there, yes.